This video is an outreach of Unity Christian Church, 5255 South Linden Road, Swartz Creek, Michigan. I am Brenda Etheridge, pastor and teacher. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the mission of Unity Christian Church is to lead people to Jesus Christ and to encourage one another on our faith journey. Bible readings are from the New Revised Standard Version and commentary is from Feasting on the Word, editing and music from the public domain by George Etheridge. Our subject today is scattering seeds. Our scripture is from Matthew chapter 13, verses one through nine and verses 18 through 23. And it reads, that day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables saying, listen, a sower went out to sow and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one, hundred, in one case, a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. Thanks be unto God for the reading and the hearing of God's word. Our parable and its interpretation are sandwiched between stories of opposition to the gospel. Jesus has already shared multiple stories of opposition and misunderstanding of his ministry. So our parable of scattering seeds may be the answer to the question, why does the gospel find hospitable space to grow among some people, but not among others? The flip side of this question is, what are the necessary conditions for fruitful discipleship? In answering these questions, Matthew gives us a practical, practical explanation of why so many more hear than understand. Why more disciples are planted than bear fruit. And which elements are necessary for fruitful discipleship. Matthew gives us at least three points of view to consider. So this parable is the parable of the sower and the parable of the four soils and the parable of the miraculous yield. 
So let's look at this parable. Jesus said, a sower went out to sow. Now my father was a farmer. And I assure you that this was not his method of sowing. Nor would Vern or Pete Jungle employ such a method. What do we make of a sower who throws seeds everywhere, even in such unlikely, unseemingly unproductive places? Who throws seeds on a well-worn path where birds can eat them or on rocky ground where it's unlikely that they will grow or among thorns that will choke them. You and I scratch our heads and wonder at such a foolish waste of seeds and other precious resources on the part of this sower. The logical place to sow seeds, of course, is on good soil. And we readily take this message to heart. Even if we are not farmers, the lesson here is easily applied to our situation. If we were ever to set about to plant a new church, Disciple Church Extension and Hope Partnership would advise us to plant it in a careful, scrutinized, sure-to-grow neighborhood. If we were to decide to develop a new missionary opportunity, they would say choose one where the odds are good and the possibilities are promising. If we ever decided to double our church membership, then craft our message for a promising demographic and reach out to people who are motivated and purposeful and driven enough to receive and do something with it. They would say, be strategic about your location. Like any self-respecting hamburger restaurant or service station or grocery chain, we would maximize our efforts toward the arena of greatest results. Find the good soil and throw seeds in it. It's just good business sense. But it seems obvious that the sower in our text is anything but a good business person. He seems willing to just fling that seed anywhere. So why does he do this? Maybe he does so in order to remind you and me that the gospel might be bigger than good business principles, bigger than just good soil. Since this is a parable, we may want to entertain the possibility that this sower throws seeds just anywhere in order to suggest that anywhere is, and in the final analysis, the arena of God's care and redemptive activity. This sower throws seeds, scatters them, not only on good soil, but also amid the rocky, the barren, the broken places in order to suggest that God's vision for the world is itself often apprehensive, uh, uh, comprehended in very strange and broken places. Commentator Theodore Wardlaw tells that he wants caught a glimpse of God and God's mercy in such broken and unlikely places. He was with a group of civic leaders, you know, lawyers, politicians, foundation uh, representatives, journalists, probably some pastors were thrown in that, and they were touring various outposts in their city's criminal justice system. It was near the end of the day and they were visiting the juvenile court and detention center. 
the place was so depressing. Its landscape marked by barbed wire mesh fences and gates with large padlocks and razor uh, wire wrapped around uh, electrical fences. When the doors clanged behind them, he imagined how final they must always sound when juveniles, simple children, were escorted there. They were led floor by floor through this facility by an amazing young judge who worked there. She showed them the holding cells where the new inmates were processed. She showed them the classrooms where um, an ongoing education was uh, at least attempted. And she showed them the courtrooms where cases were prosecuted. Near the end of their tour, she led them down uh, one bleak hall to give them a sense of the cells where the young offenders lived. Each cell had a steel door with narrow slots about two-thirds of the way up, through which various pairs of eyes were watching them as they walked down the hall. Some of the children were accused of major crimes, and some of them were even repeat offenders. Most of them, they learned, had little or no uh, nurture across their brief lives. No nurture from a primary adult who cared about them. No nurture from a family. No nurture from their neighborhood. No nature nurture from their church. It was hard to notice those eyes staring through the narrow slots without doing something. So Theodore lingered at one of the doors and he whispered to one pair of eyes, God loves you. He says the eyes did not appear to register much and sometimes he wondered what if anything happened next. Did that news fall on the path to get eaten by the birds or did it fall among thorns to get choked out? Theodore never knew. As the tour went on, the cumulative effects of all this brokenness got to one mem member of their group who finally just stopped in the hallway and began to cry. When the judge noticed this, she paused in her narrative and she walked back and she put her arms around that person and said with tears in her own eyes, I know, I understand. Theodore thought to himself, if I'm ever to be judged, I want a judge like that. And then it dawned on him like a seed thrown onto the path, that he indeed does have a judge like that. Our blessed judge, the Holy One whose ultimate judgment we now make our own, is like the sower, the scatterer of seed in our text. Our good sower, is not so cautious and strategic as to throw the seeds in only those places where the chances for growth are best. No, our sower, our scatterer of seeds is a high risk sower. Relentless and non-discriminately throwing seeds on all soil as if it were all potentially good soil, whether it's on the rocks or amidst the thorns or on the well-worn path or maybe even in a jail or maybe even in our own lives.
with such a one scattering the seeds. This passage should be a call, should be called the hundredfold harvest. Even if the harvest was only 30-fold, this story would end with a miracle. You see, a seven-fold meant a good year for a farmer, and a ten-fold meant true abundance. But 30-fold, that would feed a whole village for a year, and a hundred-fold would let the farmer retire to a villa by the Sea of Galilee. So maybe abundance, bushels of abundance, are where this parable truly leads us. Everyone in the crowd nodded his or her head as Jesus described the trials of, of traditional first century farming. You see, unlike my father and Vern, who are modern American farmers, who carefully prepare the soil with just the right pH balance and then inject the seeds into the ground. You see, farmers in Jesus's time cast the seed and then plowed the land. With this scatter, scattering approach, it's no surprise that some of the seeds fell on hard soil and others on ground too rocky for good roots and still other seeds among thorns and weeds. Those are the facts of life and everyone knows it, including Jesus. Such factors apply not only to farming but also to his ministry at that time. You see, the seed of his teaching had fallen on rock-laden, thorn-strewed ground. Jesus not only told this parable, but he lived this parable. With this parable, Jesus reminds his followers that rejection of Jesus' message does not mean that the message is wrong or that their efforts are folly. It's simply a fact of life, whether we're talking about farming or whether we're talking about faith. Like Jesus, Christians cast the gospel as broadly as the sower and the scatterer of the seeds in the parable does, with no guarantee where it lands. We share the seeds with the newcomers who come to our church. Well, maybe they're just church shopping or trying out Christianity for the first time or maybe for the second or third time. We share the seeds with the person in crisis who's probably going to vanish as soon as things get better. We scatter and share the seeds with the family who come to church for the kids, but quit as soon as soccer season starts. We share the seeds and pray that they will take root, but we also know that our odds are not any better than the sowers. Our job, though, our calling is to sow and scatter the seeds and to bear the heartburn and the heartache when it falls on rocky or arid or weed-infested ground. We stand in solidarity with the people who know the hard truth of this parable, the parents whose words of guidance and compassion fall on their children's deaf ears, know something about hard-packed ground. The business person who produces a quality product and pays their employees a living wage only to see their clients go where things are cheaper is well acquainted with some shallow roots. 
this parable reminds us all that we are not alone in such times. Even as it reminds us as it did the first crowd that heard it. The parable reminds us where to keep our focus. We are often tempted to spend our resources, our time, our energy, our hope, trying to coax, trying to congeal, to beg for growth from inhospitable places and inhospitable people. We can also spend much time despairing when the seed does not take root. But did you notice the sower, the scatterer of the seed in our parable doesn't do that. He accepts the reality that some seed, a goodly portion of it, will fall on bad soil. But did you notice he keeps sowing? As the next 15 chapters of Matthew demonstrate, Jesus kept spreading the word. No matter how dry, no matter how rocky, no matter how weed infested the ground. And we as his followers are called to do the same. But like Jesus, we have yet another calling, also found in this parable. The story does not end with the inhospitable soils. It doesn't even end with a normal harvest from the good soil. It ends with a miracle, a hundredfold harvest. It is our job to trust and to scatter the seed. The parable's ending is its greatest challenge. Jesus goes beyond simply encouraging his listeners to keep on keeping on in the face of rejection. Instead, his parable challenges them and us to believe in God's abundance. If the parable ended with the sevenfold harvest from the good soil, that would have been sufficient. A good story of encouragement and hope. However, this parable is also filled with promise. We are called to proclaim that promise, even in the face of rejection and in the realities of this world. Novelist B.B. Uh, Moore Campbell writes, some of us have that empty barrel faith, walking around expecting things to run out, expecting that there isn't enough, isn't enough air, isn't enough water, isn't enough food, Ex and expecting that someone is going to do something wrong to us. But the God I serve tells me to expect the best, that there is enough for everybody. That is the God this parable calls us to trust. Jesus knows the hard ways of this world. He also knows the abundant ways of God. May we have faith in God's abundance as we scatter the seeds of the good news everywhere we go. Amen. Each of us can receive the good news of Jesus Christ and have a personal relationship with God. Through faith and baptism, we can each receive a new identity, a life in the spirit, and grow in newness in our Christian faith. We ex invite you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Commit yourself to his ways. 
through faith in God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. O oh, merciful and loving God, we thank you for providing the good news to us. Whether we are the ones on the path or the ones on the rocky ground or the ones over in the weeds or even if we are the people with the good soil, you invite all of us to come to a knowing relationship with you. So Lord, we thank you for the power of your good news. Thank you for inviting us to be your children and partners in mission and ministry of scattering your seed with all we need. Thank you for equipping us through your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gifts that you give to us at our baptism so that we can work together for your honor and your glory. Lord, as we live into our new relationship with you, teach us to show love and concern for each person that we meet in all that we say and all that we do. Lord, teach us to trust and depend on you. Lord, we ask for your protection and your guidance and your forgiveness. Replace our fear with faith and courage. Replace our sickness with your healing. Replace our anxiety and fear with your joy and your peace and your hope and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of us. Amen.